church. God is good, amen. Let us stand as we sing the hymn this morning.
Sounds like a hurricane. I am a tree bending beneath the weight of his wind and mercy. When all of a sudden I am unaware of these afflictions eclipsed by glory, and I realize just how beautiful. You are, and how great your affections are for me. And oh, how He loves us so. And oh, how He loves us. How He loves us so. I just want to take a moment and pray for Jack and Taylor and Lorelai. Um, they've been going through some sickness and different things, and some of it is COVID and some of it's other things, but um, they're not with us today, and you probably noticed Taylor hasn't been on stage for a few weeks, and so it's been kind of an ongoing thing. They did do some traveling in between sicknesses and different stuff like that, but I just want to pray for them um, just because they're dearly missed today, and I know that um, they want to be here, and they just need some healing in their house, and so let's pray for them. Father God, we come to you right now, Lord. Just lift Jack and Taylor and Lorelai up to you, and I just pray, Lord, that you bring healing into that house, 
and I know that they're kind of out of the woods, and they'll probably be back to their normal routines later this week, but right now, Lord, I just pray a special blessing over them. Um, we love them dearly, and we miss them dearly, and I know they want to be here today worshiping with their church family and also serving with their church family later, Lord. Um, but I pray they, they recover quickly and without any incident, and they'll be with us again next Sunday. We love you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So I just have a question for you. You can answer it to yourself. How rich are you? Now, my guess, none of us feel rich. There's always someone that has more than what we have. I saw a dad wearing a T-shirt at Disney this last week, and on the back it said, hashtag broke. And I, I chuckled about that. Uh, I mean, you could wear that T-shirt just to go get gas these days, right? Um, we don't feel rich. Uh, sometimes when we think of how rich we are, we, we go to the elite rich, like Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos. If you're not building a spaceship to go into space, you're not rich. What is your standard of being rich? Is it a certain number? Like a million dollars? Is that rich? Maybe it's not a number, but it's a lifestyle or a certain vehicle that you want or um, to just to be able to travel anytime you want. Now, there are people in this room who can travel whenever they want. They can buy whatever they want when they want it. But there's also people in this room who wonder how they're going to pay the bills next month. The, the truth of the matter is we always think that someone has more. We're not rich because we're not to that level. They are rich. We don't feel rich. I remember coming across a website a few years ago, and I have actually may have shared it with you before. I, I couldn't find it this week, um, just in my quick research, but, but it's kind of like a survey, a, a quiz, and it asks you questions like, how many TVs you have in your house? How many vehicles does your household have? And, and just different stuff like that. How many items of clothing you have in your closet? And just that sort of thing. And then it would tell you how rich you are compared to the rest of the world. Americans, even low income, the lowest of income Americans, are richer than most of the world. I remember being in a village church in India, and the missionary that was our host pointed to a lady sitting on a rug, and he said, she's counting the offering. I got a little closer. I actually took a picture. You'll see it. She's separating rice and beans. That's the offering. She's dividing it up. The pastor gets a portion of that. That's how they pay their pastor. That, that pastor, that's what he and his family are going to live on for that week. Now, don't go getting any ideas. <laughs> we do have a bean counter around here, but she just says that jokingly. Our treasurer calls herself the bean counter. Even though you may not consider yourself rich, we truly are Americans. We truly are the richest people in all of history. Now, there has always been the elite rich. But as a nation, as a people, we have all of history beat. David Platt quotes a couple of um, economics professors in his book, Counterculture, that claim, speaking specifically about present-day Americans, that they conclude by any measure we are the richest people to ever walk the face of the earth. David Platt goes on to say, if you have clean water, sufficient food, clothes, a roof over your head at night, access to medicine and a mode of transportation relative to billions, with a B, billions of people in the world, we are incredibly wealthy. So even though we don't feel rich, we are rich. Even though we may struggle to pay the bills, in perspective of the whole world, we are rich. Now, the Bible has a lot of warnings um, and and teachings uh, about rich people and wealthy. And, and actually, the gospel compels us to help those in need, and we're positioned to be able to do that. We're going to look at some of these verses today. We're in our series, Living as Exiles. We've been going through the first six chapters of, of Daniel and looking at Daniel and his friends and how they 
manage to, to live as exiles in Babylon, and we're, gonna, we're learning from their experiences to help us as we live as exiles. Now, a couple weeks ago, I mentioned that we're going to take a break every once in a while from the text of Daniel to talk about a topic that's relative to our current day living as exiles, but isn't specifically talked about in the text. This is one of those weeks. The whole idea, remember, is, is living as exiles, that our, our lives, we're strangers in a strange land, and so our lives look different than those around us in the world, in the culture that we live in. As Christians today, we find ourselves living in a culture that is directly opposed to the Bible. And so if we're not careful as living as exiles, if we're not careful, our lives begin to look a lot like the cultures. There's no distinction there. And so when it comes to finances, how are we distinct? How do we look different than the culture we live in? The question I ask today is how does the way we handle our money and how we just collect possessions look different than the culture we find ourselves living in? Now, it's not wrong to have money. It's not wrong to have stuff. It's not wrong to have nice stuff. It's not wrong to save for retirement. It's not wrong to make a lot of money. It's what we do with that, how we handle that, how we steward that that makes the difference. I believe danger begins to creep in when we begin to reach levels of excess and just trying to have more just because. But not only that, we keep a closed fist on it. It's mine. And we, we're not willing to give it up if God asks us to. We build our own kingdom. And, and these are the things that our culture screams. Just keep earning, keep building, keep it all for yourself. But the biggest danger that creeps in is the lack of generosity. It's that hoarding it for yourself. The things that you have, are you willing to give them up if God asks you to? And Paul talks to young Timothy about the dangers of being rich. In 1 Timothy 6, verses 9-10, through 10, it says, Those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evils. And sometimes people get that mixed up. They say money is the root of evil. It's the love of money that's the root of all kinds of evil. Some people, eager for money, have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. He goes on to say a little bit later in verse 17 and 19, Teach those who are rich in this world not to be proud and not to trust in their money, which is so unreliable. Their trust should be in God who richly gives us all we need for our enjoyment. Tell them to use their money to do good. They should be rich in good works and generous to those in need, always being ready to share with others. By doing this, they will be storing up their treasures as a good foundation for the future so that they may experience true life. See, it's not the matter of, the problem is not having money or making money or saving money or even having possessions. It's what we do with that. What we do with our money right now, here and now, directly affects the kingdom of God. And Jesus says it this way in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 6, 19 through 21, Don't store up treasures here on earth where moths and eat them and rust destroys them, where thieves break in and steal. Store your treasures in heaven where moths and rust cannot destroy and thieves do not break in and steal. Wherever your treasure is, the desires of your heart will be also. I used to always wonder about this verse. I used to wonder, well, how do I store up treasures in heaven? And I, and I used to just think, you know, it's good deeds. If I just serve and, and do good, good deeds and help people when I can, you know, that's, that's how I store up treasures in heaven. I didn't think it had anything to do with money. Well, I was wrong. It has just, a, just as much to do with money as it does good deeds. Let's go back to 1 Timothy, verses 18 19. and 19. It says, tell them to use their money to do good, good deeds. They should be rich in good works. But also they should be generous to those in need, always being ready to share 
with others. And then he says this, by doing this, good deeds and being generous and sharing our money, by doing this, they will be storing up their treasure, the good foundation for the future, so they may experience true life. I love that phrase. We're going to come back to that phrase in just a moment. I promise you, if you live this way, you will be uh, living a life that's completely different than the culture around you. Now, your friends and family might think you're crazy. They might, if they find out you give 10% of your income to the church, they're going to really think you're crazy, be in disbelief. If they friends and family find out that you're cashing in part of your life insurance, your whole life insurance to, to contribute to a capital campaign at church or maybe selling a vehicle or selling possessions to contribute to a capital campaign, they will think you're crazy. Now, don't worry, we're not launching a capital campaign today. We might someday, though. If your friends and family see you begin to make sacrifices and you say, no, you know what, we're not going to go out to eat because we're, we're using that money to to help the poor, or to give to church, or to, to give to some other charity. And you know, they, they might, wow, I, you know, that's different. And you might be sitting there thinking, you know, Mike, I want to do more. I want to serve more. I want to give more, but I just can't right now. And I don't know where to start. It's your lucky day. I'm going to give you two things of where you can start today. Two things you can begin to start doing to handle your money differently than the culture around you. And if you do these things, I promise you, you will be living as an ex exile, a stranger in a strange land. Two things. I already mentioned David Platt a couple times earlier. These two things are actually from his book, um, Counterculture. Um, just, just the headings of them are. Um, but I, he gives five things, really. And they're all good, but just for our time today, I picked the two I think would help us the most. Number one, live simply. You know, people say the more you have, the more you have to worry about. And some of you understand that. A lot of people live beyond their means or right at their means. They make their paycheck, they spend their paycheck. There's no margin in their life. A lot of people don't have an emergency fund. People make money and spend money. If you want to begin storing up your treasures in heaven, if you want to experience true life, you must begin living simply. And here are some tips to help you do that. First, give your tithes and offerings first thing before anything else. Before you pay your bills, before you spend it on entertainment, before you go shopping, um, before anything else, give. Then, look for things you don't need anymore and start to get rid of them. Sell them. Give to the poor. Donate them to help an organization that helps people. Begin cleaning things out. Simplify your life. I started watching a show a couple years ago on Netflix about minimalists. Because every once in a while, I kind of get an inkling, okay, I need to simplify my life. And I kind of want to be a minimalist. <laughs> I struggle with that. I also like stuff. But, but I get the urge to downsize occasionally here and there. And so I thought, you know what, this show may inspire me. Well, there's extremes in this too. <laughs> you ever seen the show Minimalists on Netflix? They, I mean, they live on barely anything. These people get rid of everything and just live on nothing, really. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm not saying we have to just get rid of everything. It's also okay to have something just for our enjoyment. It's interesting. The verse, First uh, Timothy six seventeen says, "Their trust should be in God, who richly gives all that we need for our enjoyment." So it's okay to have some things for your enjoyment. But there was a time in my life where I kind of got a little extreme. We were a young family. We had two young girls, just barely making ends meet. Um, I mean, we, we made enough to where Marla stayed home, but we made a lot of sacrifices for that to happen, and so we lived paycheck to paycheck. Actually, we lived 
where we would go to Walmart two days before payday and write a check because we knew it wouldn't clear the bank till the check made the bank. I don't know if any of you lived that way before. I've lived that way before. So we were, we were barely making ends meet. And I had a couple items just for enjoyment. I had this pool table in my house, and I had a hammock in the backyard. And I began to think, I'm, I'm barely able to pay my bills. I began to think, you know what? This pool table and this hammock is crazy. I don't know why I have them. It's like I have this stuff, and there's people all around the world who don't even have food. And I began to get extreme about getting rid of stuff. The total amount was probably just a couple hundred bucks. But it was kind of foolish. I, luckily, I had wise people that spoke into my life and talked me down off the ledge. Uh, I did end up selling the pool table and the hammock when we moved to Florida which is interesting because God used those things to help us afford to be able to move to Florida, which was part of his plan. You can have things for enjoyment. Just don't let them control you. And if you sense God is telling you to get rid of them, be willing to get rid of them. Don't hang on so tightly. I'm guessing that there are things in all of our lives that we could simplify. If you want to begin storing up treasures in heaven and experiencing the good life. Begin by living simply. Create that margin. Here's the really cool thing about having margin in your life, especially financial life. This is true for the church too. This is a goal of mine for the church that we have financial margin so that when God calls us to do something, when God calls us to act, we can say yes. If you have no margin, when God calls you to to give to this or to support this, you have to say no. We want to create margin so we can begin saying yes when God calls. So live simply. Number two, give sacrificially. Sacrificial giving is an example, uh, is the example that we see throughout all of Scripture. In the Old Testament, David had messed up before God. And I mean, it's kind of a weird story in 2 Samuel 24, but. He really messes up, and God is angry with him, and God is going to punish the country Israel because of what David did. And he gives them three choices. Isn't that like the worst punishment you get? I remember doing that to my daughters. I'm like, okay, you can either either give me your phone for 24 hours or be grounded for a week. And like make them decide which is the worst punishment. God did this to David. And David chose a punishment of three days of extreme famine and 70,000 people died. Now, we don't know what the, uh, the consequences of the other punishments were. There could have been way more carnage. But David repented and came to God, and God says, you know what? You need to build an altar and, and give a burnt offering. And so he gave him specific place, a farmer's land, actually a, a threshing floor of a farmer, He said, go there and build an altar and make a a burnt offering. So David goes to this farm. He says, look, the Lord told me to come here to build an altar and make a burnt offering. And the farmer goes, have it all. You can have the threshing floor. You can have the wood. You can have the oxen. It's all yours. Do what you need to do to make it right. But David wouldn't take it without paying for it. In 2 Samuel 24, 24, he says, no, I insist on buying it. For I will not present a burnt offering to the Lord my God that has cost me nothing. Sacrificial giving. In the New Testament, we see Jesus watching people give their offering in the, in the temple, in, in the box of the temple, and he sees this old widow just give two small coins. He says, that's the one who gave the most today, even though people may have given way more, way bigger amounts. And Luke 21, 3 through 4 said, I tell you the truth, Jesus says, the poor widow has given more than the rest of them, for they have given a tiny part of their surplus, but she, poor as she is, has given everything she has. Again, that picture of sacrificial giving. We also have the church in Macedonia who gave more than they could afford. Paul gives a testimony about them. 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and verse 3 says, I can testify that they gave not only what they could afford, but far more, and they did it on their own free will. This is the type of giving we see 
throughout the Bible. This is the type of giving that stores up treasures in heaven. The type of giving that is completely different than the world that we live in. The type of giving that will help us experience true life. C.S. Lewis writes this in the book, Mere Christianity. He says, I do not believe one can settle how much we ought to give. I'm afraid the only safe rule is to give more than we can spare. In other words, if our expenditure on comfort, luxuries, amusements, etc. is up to the standard common among those with the same income as our own, we are probably giving away too little. If our charities do not at all pinch or hamper us, I would say they are too small. There ought to be things we should like to do and cannot do because our charity's expenditure excludes them. Sacrificial giving. What does it cost you? Does it hurt just a little bit? If we do these two things, if we live simply and give sacrificially, we'd be able to store up treasures in heaven and experience true life. Living this way is definitely opposite than the culture that we live in. People will look at you funny. They'll question you. Some may even object, like, don't do it. This is completely foreign to our culture. It may be completely foreign to you. Maybe you're thinking, you know what, Mike, you're crazy. Give it a try. Look for ways to simplify your life. And begin giving, even though it may cost you something. Let me pray for you. Father, it seems that one of the most difficult areas of life for us to look different than the culture we live in is is with our finances. There's just something in us that causes us to want more and to build more and to save more. Sometimes even to the point of living beyond our means just to get more. I pray for contentment, Lord. I, I pray that you help us be content with what we have. I pray we all begin to, to live simply and give sacrificially, not only to be different from the world, but to further your kingdom, to be able to say yes to you when you call us to do something, to be able to store up treasures in heaven so that we can experience true life. Help us in all this, Lord. I pray for these people. I pray they see that you work in their lives and that when they do try this, that when they give sacrificial Lord, show them, just show up in their life, show them what you can do. Father, I pray you give us the faith to live this way, and I pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to go into our time of response and also our time of communion. If you didn't get a chance to pick up communion when you came in, that's on the tables by the front doors and just help yourself and you know one thing when we talk about how rich we are and I didn't even get into it in the sermon today but when we think about that in spiritual terms how rich are we spiritually we're wealthier on anything the Bible says that the generous love of Jesus that he who was rich made himself poor so that he could make us rich. And all that happens through his sacrifice on the cross. We're going to remember that. The bread is his body broken for you. The juice is his blood shed for you. It's because of that sacrifice that we are made rich through the grace of God. We're going to remember that. Maybe you need to think about your life Maybe you've been living beyond your means. Maybe you've been just building your own little kingdom and and not thinking about how you can create margin to help build God's kingdom. Maybe you need to have a conversation as far as that. Maybe, Maybe you haven't been giving like you should. You're just giving and it doesn't affect you at all. Maybe you need to challenge yourself to give more until it hurts a little. Whatever you have going on in your life, you need to talk to the Father. You have this time to do so.
Today is a big day for us here at PCC. Uh, we have a church-wide service project after second service, so around 11.30. So I know that you guys are here way early for that. So you can stick around, just hang out if you want to. Um, or you can go get breakfast, come back at 11.30. We'd love to have you help us. We're going to be packaging meals that will eventually be shipped to Ukraine. And um, it's, going to be a, it's going to be a fun process. It's going to be a way not only to, to serve and pack meals, but to connect with some of your church family, people you're sitting by that you maybe, maybe you've been sitting by them for a long time and it's too long before you can ask their name. You know that awkward, like, it's time to learn people's names. It's time to um, serve alongside your church family. So we invite you back at 1130 to be a part of that. Um, also, there is Sunday nights tonight. This is our last Sunday nights. Um, for a little while, we're taking the month of July off, but we are having Sunday nights. The women are watching The Chosen here in this room at 4 o'clock. We have PCC Kids, PCC Youth. We have a men's small group that's doing stuff. We also have another small group that meets um, just for anybody, and so we invite you to come back for that as well. It's going to be a great day. Thank you all for being here. If this is your first time, welcome. We're glad that you're here. We have an orange tent outside. Um, I'm going to try to get there as quick as I can. We have a small gift for you. just like to connect with you and welcome you. But we're glad you're all here. Um, it's, a, it's a great day. Come serve with us. As you go, please take care of your trash. Leave your offering in the basket. And really hope you have a great week. Thank you.